I will give the Dolphins this. Their passion, their commitment, their dedication to this apparent obvious tank job is unwavering. And for that, I salute you. If you're going to do it, you might as well go all the way. You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Because they've been at it, man. They have absolutely been at it. You look at that Laramie Tunsil deal being able to get what the hell they got to give up a young left tackle who is not an elite left tackle. I mean, you have to make that deal. You have to make that deal. And not surprisingly, based off the results of week one, and we can also see the results of week two, uh, we weren't going to be the last players they were going to be dealing because now other guys are wanting out. And we found out a few days ago that Minka Fitzpatrick, the Dolphins' first-round pick from last year, was ready to get the hell out of town. And he was requesting a trade, and the Dolphins were eager to facilitate it. Well, seeing as how what they were able to pull off, I can't blame the Dolphins for doing so. But who traded for Mika Fitzpatrick, basically, especially based off of the situation that they're in, really, really surprised me. So get this. The Miami Dolphins have traded Minka Fitzpatrick to the Pittsburgh Steelers, the 0-2, now without Big Ben for the rest of the season, Pittsburgh Steelers, for a 2020 first round pick. Wow. I'm not surprised Minka was traded. I'm not even surprised, potentially, that he was traded for a first round pick. I am really surprised that an 0-2 Pittsburgh team that just lost their future Hall of Fame franchise quarterback to a season-ending elbow injury is trading away a potential top-10 pick for Minka Fitzpatrick. Now, sure, if you want to take the completely optimistic spin on this, if you're the Steelers, you can say, they get a young, versatile secondary player in Minka Fitzpatrick in Pittsburgh who has four years potentially left on his rookie contract, so a lot of team control at a very reasonable number, which is true. You say that this is a team that doesn't draft their defensive backs very well, see Artie Burns, see Edmonds, and you could also say true. So let somebody else make the evaluation for you, then you pluck in and get them. True. You could also say is if that first-round pick ends up in the 10-15 to 15 range, that's basically where Minka was taken in 2018, so how much different is it really? That also is potentially true. But golly, that is some really optimistic, terrible towel waving around spit. I just, this deal is puzzling to me from the Pittsburgh Steelers standpoint. By making this deal, giving away a first-round pick and swapping other picks as well, I think it was also a fifth-round pick, if I'm not mistaken, involved in 2020. The Steelers, to me, are saying one of three things. Is Number one, they really, really believe in Mason Rudolph. Number two, they're trying to make a statement to that locker room that... The season's not over yet just because Big Ben is out. And again, number three, the organization is delusional about what their current position is. Again, this is not like it was a 2-0 and Steelers team that has Big Ben, or even a 1-1 and Steelers team that still has Big Ben. If you still had Big Ben playing for the entire season, you traded the first-round pick for Minka, it makes a ton of sense to me. I would not knock it. Because the situation is different. But that's not the situation we're looking at. I'm sorry if you believe in Mason Rudolph. That is cool. The reality is we do not know what he is at the NFL level or not. But that is an awful lot of hope and an awful lot of projection. And even if he is somewhat decent, you've already started off 0-2. The chances of making the playoffs after starting 0-2 are not good. Not good. Not good. And to top it all off, you have lost your future Hall of Fame franchise quarterback 
for the last 14 games of the season when you're already 0-2. Again, your playoff potential looks really, really not good. So why would you trade next year's first-round pick, not knowing how this season is going to play out, to where, for all the hell you know, the team, the locker room could totally quit on Mike Tomlin, Mason Rudolph could be total dookie, and all of a sudden you're looking at having given away a top five or seven pick for a guy that was taken number 11 in 2018. That's just puzzling. Side note. Points out how much the Cardinals botched the Rosen trade. A year later, they took a guy that was taken 10th overall and turned him into Andy Isabella, who was taken late in round two. The Dolphins, a year later, after taking Minka Fitzpatrick, were able to get a first-round pick out of him. That could potentially get back into that range of somewhere around pick 11. But what happens if that pick is top five? What happened if that pick could have put you in a potential position where you could have found that real, true franchise quarterback heir apparent to Big Ben. Because I promise you, if you were in that position in 2020 without Big Ben coming off of the elbow injury, whether he wants to play or not, doesn't matter. You'd have to take that young kid, even if he sat behind Big Ben for a period of time. You can't just think about one year. you got to think about the next 5, 10, 15, 20 damn years down the road. And even if you want to sit there and say, well, you make this deal now, it's like getting a first-round pick next year into the fold a year early, and he'll be there in 2020. If you bring Big Ben back so and he's healthy, so be it. You can make a run with him. Okay, maybe. But was it worth potentially giving up an even higher draft pick to do so? Like, if you're trying to make a statement to the team saying the season's not over yet, that's one thing. If you really believe in Mason Rudolph, here's, here's my thing about Mason Rudolph. Is that if you really, truly believed in him that much, you probably would have believed in him five months ago when the draft happened. And if you had believed in him to that level, to where you've potentially shown this much confidence in him, Instead of trading up into the top 10 to take Devin Bush, the linebacker from Michigan, you would have stayed put at pick 20 and fuck what everybody said. You would have taken Mason Rudolph because you would have had the confidence that he would have been your long-term franchise guy and there would have been a tremendous amount of value by taking him in round number one instead of round number three to be able to get that fifth-year option where you could have an extra year of control on your young quarterback, which would have been so critical. So I even dispute just how much they truly value Mason Rudolph. But maybe they brought him into the fold and they believe in him. Maybe. But man, oh man. You talk about weird, surprising, kind of puzzling trades and puzzling decisions. This one's there. It's not that Minka is bad. Or it's not that his contract is bad. Because neither one of those statements is true. It's just, what if? The Steelers took a chance here because if that pick ends up in the top five or seven and could have put them in a position to draft Big Ben's long-term replacement, then they will look foolish for having pissed that away for a versatile defensive back. Tell me how I'm wrong.